Okay, uh, hi everybody. Hi, uh, my name is Ram. This is going to be a talk about PySnooper. Uh, PySnooper is a cute little open source project that I wrote a month ago, and I was very surprised and delighted when it got much more popular than I thought it would. It got around almost, I guess, 11,000 stars on GitHub, so I was very, very proud. Posted it on Hacker News and on Reddit and on other sites, and it kind of got viral. And everybody, it kind of blew up, got lots of contributors immediately, people fixing bugs and implementing features, features. It was really exciting. So this talk is going to be about what this project is and how, how it would help you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how you could use PySnooper. Uh, I'm going to talk about how, how PySnooper works as, de as a debugging tool. Uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to show you another debugging tool called PUDB. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh, speak a little bit about what I did to make my open source project go viral. Uh, and I'm going to float a pep idea for uh, making debuggers in Python easier to, debu to debug. And also I'm going to try to sell you on my consulting services and Python training services. So, so let's start with that. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is Ram. Uh, I've been uh, doing Python development for 10 years now. Uh, I've been working for all kinds of companies, small companies, big companies. I've been working on various open source projects as a freelancer. and. Uh, I've had lots of experience with Python, and I, I organized the PyWebIL meetup. For anyone who isn't familiar with it, PyWebIL is like a mini version of PyCon. It happens once in two months. We meet at Google, at Google Campus uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, you're welcome to join our meetup page. Uh, on every meetup, uh, two or three people uh, uh, volunteer to give uh, talks about different, different uh, topics related to Python and or web and or anything somewhat related, so feel free to join. Yeah. I give a Python workshops. Let's do, let's do the Hebrew one. It's my site, pythonworkshops.co.il or .co if you want the English version. I give Python training in companies. If you have a team that you would like to improve their Python skills, please contact me and I'll be happy to talk with you. Okay, now with that out of the way, let's talk about PySnooper. Uh, so PySnooper is, a, PySnooper is a tool for debugging. Um, it, it, this means that it's a tool for um, these times where your code, you have a bug, and you're looking at your code and you try to figure out why the bug is happening. And you look at your code and it seems like it should be doing the right thing, but it's not. And you're trying to, to, to bridge the gap between what you think your code is doing and what it, it is actually doing. Now, I personally really like to use a debugger. I'm going to show you the debugger that I use. This debugger is called Wing IDE. Uh, most probably, most people here never even heard about it, but it's basically the same thing as PyCharm, just a different company. Okay, so I, I personally really like to use debuggers, so I'm just, just going to demonstrate a debugger with a really simple function. This is just a random func function that, that I found online that takes a number and converts it to binary by um, returning a list of, uh, of numbers. Uh, so let's, uh, let, let, let's uh, debug this program. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here, and I'm going to start debug. Uh, and now the debugger is stopping here, and I can bring up the shell. And I can use the shell to get any information that I want about the running program. I can get the value of variables. For example, I got the value of the number of the variable number, which is six. I can step through the program, and I can basically see anything that my, my program does. Now, I know that in the Python world, um, there are so many people who don't use debuggers, and I guess for some it's a question of taste. Some people don't like it, and that's okay. Personally, I really love it. For me, it's my favorite way of understanding what's happening in my code. Um, but over the years, I've noticed that lots of people, when they want to understand what their program is doing, they do something like this. Right? I, I, I would guess that every single person in the audience has done something like this, this maybe this week. Okay? You, have a code, you have a piece of code, you want to understand why, what it's doing, so you put a bunch of print statements in it. So l let's run it as, as it is. I'm going to put that in the center. Okay. 
Uh, so I, I ran this now, and I get all, all the stuff that I printed, and this can kind of give me an idea of what my function does. And what you usually also do is add more information like this. Right? If, if I had Python 3.8, I would do the equals, but I don't have it, fortunately. You could do something like this, and now you also have the value of, the, of your value variable. So basically, over the years, I, I've sp spent a lot of time sitting next to people who uh, program in Python, and I've seen them do this thing where they add the print statements, and then they run their code, and then they figure out they, they haven't put their print statements in the right place, so they move them around, they expose variables that they weren't exposed last time. And I have mixed feelings about this method. Um, on, on one hand, it's very beautiful. On the, on the other hand, it's very ugly. Uh, the reason it's ugly is because you have to like, manually put these print statements in your code. And you have to like, change your code. And then you have to go back and forth and changing it and running it. And sometimes there's a deploy step, which takes a lot of time. And that, that is such a waste. And I, I really hated seeing people doing it. And thinking that people all over the world are spending so much time just putting print statements in their code, running it, changing them. So I figured, OK, so why don't people use debuggers? Um, some people don't, don't like it, and that's OK. But uh, um, I, I noticed that a big reason that people don't use debuggers is because um, they look simple on simple cases, but most people don't know that they could be used in, uh, in more complicated cases. Like right now, I made using a debugger look easy, because I have just one file, and I just ran, went, ran the file, and, and it was easy. But if I was working for a corporate client or any kind of complex project, it wouldn't be just one Python file. It would be like 100 Python files, and they're all on a remote machine that's in a different country, and, and there's, there's multi-processing and multi-threading in, in, in there. It's all in a Docker container inside a VM on a machine that's held hostage in an unknown location. Everything is very complicated when you incorporate it. And, and the script isn't even um, invoked by Python directly. It's invoked by a service that starts Python. And most people don't even know that it's possible to shove the debugger in there. Uh, but by, by the way, whenever I say debugger, I mean, I use Wing, but most people use PyCharm. So for, I would think that for 90% of the people here, debugger equals PyCharm. So that's what I mean. Um, most people don't even know that it's possible to configure their, their uh, debugger to work in such, such conditions. It is possible. I've done it, but it's really complicated. Most people don't really want to put the effort in for that. So I figured, now I'm getting to what is the solution that I offer. I figured, let's try to uh, create a solution that's somewhere in the middle. Uh, that we have debuggers on one end, which are very powerful, but uh, but they're uh, uh, hard to configure. And we have print statements, which are very crude, but they work everywhere. And, and that's a really nice thing about them. They work everywhere. Doesn't matter how convoluted your setup is. Doesn't matter whether it's running on a different machine. If your code runs, it can print. And instead of printing, you know, if you don't have, have access to standard out, you can uh, write to a file or to a log. Same, same kind of thing. Um, so that's the really nice thing about print functions. They always work. They, it's, it's a fail-safe uh, method. So, so I figured, let's do something that is as reliable as print function and as simple to use, but a little bit more like a debugger, as in giving more information. So that's what PySnooper is about. So now, now I'm going to demonstrate. Say I want, to, uh, I want to figure out what this function is doing. I'm going to delete the print statements. And this is how I'm going to use PySnooper. OK, so I just imported PySnooper and then uh, decorated my, my function with uh, the snoop decorator. And I could do this to any kind of function or method. And now let's see what happens when I run it. OK, sorry, small font, so it's going to be difficult to see. I'm going to enlarge the, the window. Oof. Sorry. OK, I basically get a text like this. Um, OK, so this is kind of a, a text dump that basically shows me everything that the function did, everything that my code did. Every line that ran, it says that it ran, the, the line ran. Every variable that, get, that got declared, it's going to show its value. And every time a variable get, gets modified, it shows the new value. This is basically a play-by-play -play of my function. I can, I can look at this, and I, I can kind of see everything that happened in my function. Uh, so this can be a pretty big text dump, but the idea is that, that instead of having to go back and forth a million times to modify your print statements, you can just get a, a huge dump of all the data um, in one go, and then you could look for it and look for the kind of, kind of things that, uh, 
that could interest you and that could help you solve your bug. Uh, any questions so far? Are we doing the job in the oh, with our decorator, uh, it's also possible to um, to run it like this. Oh uh, no, it's not possible to do it without, without modifying the source. Of course, it would it would be great, but um, PySnooper is more of like a cute little tool. It's not. It's not it, I call it a poor man's debugger. So uh, yes, that th th that is a disadvantage. Uh, I, I was planning to tell you how I implemented PySnooper, but then there were like at least two talk in this conference that kind of spoiled the, the surprise for me. But uh, I'm, I'm going to show you anyway. So yeah, I use the magic of the set trace uh, function that comes with Python, and that set trace function lets me set my uh, my own function that basically runs between every every two lines of Python, and then in 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 my function in my trace function, I get the frame and the event and the arg, and then I have a whole lot of logic that's going to be really complex to follow, um, and that logic uh, prints all the statements. Uh, any more questions about how to use PySnooper and stuff? Yeah. Uh, um, okay, the question was whether you could put the, put the Snoop decorator in and then have it not active and then like activate it like on demand. That's a nice idea, and I would be I would be tempted to implement it, but um, I'm I'm careful not to uh, I'm care I'm careful to leave PySnooper as a cute little tool because I'm so tempted to add this and add that, and it's just going to be a debugger at the end. So I figured let, let's keep it simple, but, but yeah, nice idea. And I, I guess if you use it with a width, it's, it's possible to use it as a, as a context manager like this. And if you do that, I guess you could you know, do something a little bit tricky to, uh, to make it conditional. But I'm gonna go back to the decorator method. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the open source side of things. Uh, so I released a uh, PySnooper, and I, let, let's show the GitHub page. And I released it, and I posted it on uh, Hacker News, and it got really popular. It got, let's see how many, uh, you know, upvotes. It got 675 upvotes. It got to the top of the front front page. Lots of people commented, and then it, it got because it got lots of lots of stars on GitHub. Then it got to GitHub trending, and then it really blew up. It got really crazy. It got all kinds of contributions. There is even a video of a Chinese guy speaking about PySnooper. You, you know you've made it when you know a Chinese guy has, makes a video about you. So I, I know that lots of people here could be interested in. A, creating their own open source project and getting it popular. So I'm just going to share what I did in case it could be helpful. Though The first thing I would say is that lots of it is luck. I've done all sorts of open source projects over the years. Most of them, most of them failed. Only, I would say that only Python Turtle and PySnooper got really successful. So I did all kinds of open source projects that just died in my GitHub. Uh, learn my lessons. Uh, so that's basically basically what you need to know is this. I would say that around 50% of the of the importance of the project is to to do good marketing for it. As in, do a good readme that explain exa explains exactly the pain point of the of the person who would be using your software. Use use a good tagline. I used never use print for debugging again, which means I'm going straight for the pain point of the of the person for whom I'm solving the problem. Uh, this is actually this is way too long for README. By the way, this is way too much text. I should, it should be shorter, and and have an example immediately as soon as possible. Possible. I mean, basically, when you're making a GitHub page, you should be thinking, I have now, I now have 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds of the user's attention before he hits the back button, and I, I just try, try to, to give them, give them something interesting in, in just 30 seconds. So basically giving the, the most simplest uh, example possible and then the output of that, that, that example. I did give an explanation here, and most people really like this paragraph. Uh, what makes PySnooper stand out from all other code intelligence tools? Uh, you can use, use it in your shitty, sprawling enterprise code base without having to do any setup. So people really like the fact that I, I, I'm talking exactly, I know how bad their problem is. And I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm marketing my solution exactly, exactly to their problem. Um, 
Lit so some, some more about uh, how to make your project popular. So you have to post to Hack and Use, and Reddit, uh, you could post on the Python subreddit or any other po uh, relevant subreddit. Yeah, on, hack on Hacker News, and this is, I would say, the only kind of dark pattern that I've used, it's important to get a few friends to upload it immediately as you post it, uh, just to get it to the kind of critical mass. Because when you post something to Hacker News, it gets on the new page. The new page is where uh, all the new links go. Links go. And almost everything there just has like one point because that's basically where links go to die. So when you submit a link, it just goes to the new page. Most people wouldn't see it. So if you have like three or four friends upload it within the first five minutes, that's enough to get it on the front page for just a little bit. And at that point, um, if it's interesting, it's going to get uploaded. And then, it, then just kind of things just happen. I mean, after you get uploaded on Hacker News, things just happen. Like, uh, D David Beasley retweeted about this, and then lots of people came in. And I, I have no idea how, how it came to him, but, but after it gets high on Hacker News, more people upload it, people share it, and it just kind of happens by itself. Uh, so after you get lots of points on Hacker News, if you get lots of stars on, on GitHub, then it starts a new viral cycle where you get higher on the GitHub trending page, get more visitors, get more stars, and then things explode. Uh, I've had lots of, uh, since it got popular, I've had lots of uh, people uh, contribute. Lots of people submitted pull requests, fixed bugs, uh, implemented new features, so that, that was pretty awesome. I even, I even, got, I even got into the, to the, to the state where now when people um, submit a pull request, someone else comes in to review their pull request, and I just, you know, come in at the end to review the review. So yeah, living the dream. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, do, do feel free to interject with questions if you have them. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's possible to control the level of details. Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there are all kinds of uh, arguments I'm going to show you. Uh, if, you. If you have a fancy IDE like I do, by the way, Wing is awesome, then when you, when you open, when you start calling a function, you get all the possible uh, arguments that it could take. And one of them, okay, so I'm, I'm going to. Okay, so uh, output could, uh, uh, you could specify file name and then it's going to output it to a file instead of a standard output. You can also put in a callable and then it's just going to call it with a the, with the text output. Uh, you asked about how to get more information, right? More in-depth? Less information. It can't help you with that, sorry. It's uh, either a huge text dump or nothing. But, I'm, uh, but since you've asked, I'm going to talk about more information. Um, there is the watch argument, and you can specify a, a variables that it's going to watch in addition to the local variables. Because when I showed you the when, when I showed you, you this text dump, then it did follow the variables, but only the local ones. Um, so when you use watch, when you use the watch argument, um, it it could also follow. Um, variables that are not local or functions or any kind of Python expression. You know what? I'm just going to leave watch explode as an exercise to the reader. Uh, depth, if you specify depth of more than one, then it's going to show you not only every line of your function, but every line of every function that your function calls. So that can get really huge. Um, so depth equals two, depth equals three are going to be huge text dumps. A prefix uh, lets you put a piece of text before each line of the output. Uh, useful if you put it in a, in a big log file that you want to discriminate between the Python upper lines and the other lines that you have. Um, and these are just boring, not interesting. As long as we're talking about debugging, uh, I would also like to show another cute little debugging tool called PODB. Uh, I know that lots of people uh, are familiar with PDB. I've tried it a few times. Uh, and I will never do it again. I, I hate it so much. It, it, it's like a text-based adventure. You're just staring at the screen. You can't see your code. You don't know what hap what's happening. You kind of have to ask it politely to show you, to show your code. Um, but um, I've, I've realized that not many people know about PUDB, which is a really nice tool. So now we're looking at the same piece of code we had before, that same number to bits function. Is it vis visible? Let's see. OK. Okay, um, so if I, if I were to run this code now, it would output 110, which is six in binary. So now let's show how to use PUDB. So, okay, to install it, pip install PUDB. Spoiler, I already, already did that. PUDB, foo.py. Basically, invoke PUDB instead of invoking Python. And then you get something like this. 
Now, if there are people over 30 in the audience, you, you might get a li little bit nostalgic because this is very similar to the Boland-like interfaces of the 90s. I personally love it. It, it can be a little bit uh, difficult to understand how to operate it, but this is basically like a debugger GUI inside the shell. It's a very nice solution for these times where you wanted a debugger, but you are constrained to the shell and you got no other choice and you can't use like PyCharm or Wing and you really want to use debugger, so that, that's a nice solution. Uh, the thing that is most com complicated about it is how to operate it because it's operated in entirely with the keyboard and there, you, you can see it in the top line, there, in the top line, in the top line there, there are letters saying what, what each letter does and if I would press the question mark, there's gonna be a long help screen here uh, showing what every letter does. So I could, for example, uh, press next and continue. And I can, I can step through the code and I can, and I can set breakpoints wherever I, I want. I actually already had a breakpoint there. I'm gonna cancel it. And now, now it went to the end. Let's, let's run it again. Uh, N go, does next and S does step into. And this is, this is basically like a kind of a mini version of, of PyCharm. And at, at any point, I can press the exclamation mark and I get a shell. And I can type stuff and I can get the, the result. Okay, so can, I can basically see the value of all my, all my variables. They are also displayed here. Yeah, I can go to any module. I can travel uh, up and down the stack. Um, the only thing that, that's really uh, difficult is that you have to kind of um, study the, the keys that do each, each thing. So that, that's, that's kind of annoying. But other than that, really cute little tool. Uh, I, I also wanted to talk about a little difficulty that I had, and which gives me an idea for a PEP, a, a Python enhancement pr proposal. Um, so as you've seen in a couple of, of talks here already, um, the way that the debuggers are implemented is using the set trace function. So set trace uh, tells Python, um, please take my trace method and please use it uh, after every line that runs. So that's kind of a nice way uh, to implement, implement a debugger. And every Python, okay, almost every kind of Python debugger that you know has been implemented using set trace. And also the coverage tool that measures uh, line coverage is implemented with set trace. Now, one of the annoying things when you are developing a debugging tool or a coverage tool is that you can't use a debugger tool or a coverage tool yourself. I, I have automated testing for PySnooper and I have, and I tried to set up coverage measure, measuring for it, but then I saw that the coverage measuring tool isn't really measuring my code because, because, it's, because when I call sys.setrace, it overrides the tracer of the coverage tool. And I also can't use a debugger to debug what's happening inside my tracer. So, so, so that's been really annoying because I, I, want, I want to have the confidence that my, I have full coverage on my code. And I, I would think that people who, uh, who work on debuggers and coverage tools, they also want to use these tools. So here's what I would like to see in Python. I, I, would, like, um, I would like for it to be possible to set multiple levels of tracers. Um, when, I, when I do sys.setrace, I don't want to replace the debugger's tracer, I just want to add a tracer, which means that every time a, a, a code line runs, it should call both my tracer and, and the debugger's tracer. So I, I kind of want there, there to be a stack of tracers, one above the other. And of course, this is gonna add more complica complication to the language and it is kind of a niche use, use case. But uh, I'll be happy to see it in the language. It will make my life easier. And it's possible, I'm interested in doing more debugging tools in the future. So it will be easier for me if that would be implemented. So if anyone here would be interested in writing a PEP, let me know and I'll be happy to help you. Okay, um, so I think I'm done. Are there any questions? Yeah. Does it work for multiprocesses? <laughs> Or yeah, that's a good question. Okay, let, let me tackle that uh, one by one. Uh, Multi-threaded, probably yes. For multi-process, um, I think that w w once you get to the use case, I mean, if, if you were to try to define a use case for what you mean by multi-processing, it, it's going to be difficult to, to define it because if, if you mean that the function itself, um, if the function itself is spawning more processes, no, PySnooper is not going to uh, step into these processes. Um, but, but if you are using uh, multiprocessing to launch a function which, which is already decorated with PySnooper, then yes, it's gonna track that function. 
Um, I, I, I could add more, com more um, powerful multiprocessing support, but I just want to keep it as a toy because it's so tempting. I, I've, I had so many pull requests and features requests for things that are awesome and complex, and I just had to stop it at one point, at some point, because it's just going to get more complicated until it's just a debugger, and then I've done nothing. So yeah, sorry. Okay, okay, uh, good question. Uh, Shai asked uh, how a PyStopper could work with the async code. Uh, th there was a pull request for that. The work wasn't done well enough, and, and I deferred it, and it's deferred until further notice. And I kind of suck at async await, so I don't really know how to implement it. I, I did implement it for generators, with your help, thanks. Uh, but uh, it's currently not implemented for async await, so if anyone would like to submit a pull request for that implementation, you're welcome. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.